Do you know, one minute I'll be like, no, I'm not a doctor. And people will be like, oh, okay, now you're good. Then when I saw it, mm-mm, man, why is like the noise is going down? Then I come back mm-hmm. and I'm like, yes, guys, I'm a doctor. And then Vujugu again. So it was just that. Uh, you you repeatedly saying you, f- you feel like you should have finished your degree. Yeah. On record, you did not finish your degree. I didn't. Um, uh, 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 I think you owe me. <laughs> let me let me get straight I into do. that. I think you owe me because I think we're over a year trying to do this. Over a year. It's been over a year. Yep. There is so much that has happened, like a lot, lady. A but lot. I think it's worth the wait. Absolutely, absolutely. You know? I, yeah. I believe in timing. I believe in seasons. So. Um, exactly. you, you're one person <laughs> where uh, you don't have to worry. I, I'm just teasing. <laughs> um, but there's something, there's something I want to show you before we get into it. So can, can I get my bag, please? Yo. There's something in there. Because I want to see um, what, what this will trigger in you. Mm. Uh, I hope it's still here. <clears throat> please open this. I wonder. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I. Okay, let's see. Okay, wait. I want to see your skill of opening it. Firstly, okay, guys. I have soft hands. So. Yes. Okay. okay yes. Yeah. See, you've done it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think I remember this video. Really? I do. Yes. With the with that, I think. Yes. Yes. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Yes. Yeah. Well, wait. Sorry. Do you still remember how to use this? Yes. What is that? Maybe somebody can't see. Uh, they're listening and they're not watching. Okay, so basically this is a syringe. Yeah. Yeah. Or what would you use it for ordinarily? So with this one, we'll just... Um, so it's, we'll put medication into sure. the drip mm-hmm. using this. Okay, so that's this the one that's go, for me. Yeah, for yeah, the drip. Exactly. So this will go in there. Yeah. And then, yeah, the medication into the uh, IV bag. Perfect. <laughs> Good day. Let me get that as well. Thank you, guys. <laughs> um, good morning. Good afternoon. Good day. Whatever time zone you're in. Exactly. Um, welcome to welcome to the show. Thank you. Um, it's a privilege to have you. Thank you. Uh, you you here to be vulnerable with us. This is a vulnerable platform, so mm-hmm. we really appreciate it. Um, I I'm not a person who goes in depth with. Uh, the, the, the norms and how people conduct these conversations about trying to understand uh, the basics of a person's life. But yeah. for purposes of understanding and correcting narratives that have been wrong, we were laughing before we, we started going on camera that people are even getting where your dad comes from wrong. <laughs> L- let's get that out of the way. Okay. Um, who is Matthew Lani? Where is Matthew Lani born and bred? Mm-hmm. And... What is your identity around where you come from? Okay. Well, Matthew Lani is a personality. Bongani Lani is the person. I get you. You I know. Get you. So Matthew is not even my ID name. Okay. So Bongani Lani is um, born in Joburg, but then raised in the Northwest, a tiny, tiny town called Christiana in the Northwest, raised by a single mother. So... My mom's colored. Uh, my dad is closer, but from Kimberley. But I'm not really from Kimberley because the last time I was there, I think I was like, what, eight months when my dad died? And then ever since I've been between the Northwest and Johannesburg. So if I would say I'm going home, homeland, that would be in the Northwest. Dad died at eight months old. Mm. Did mom raise you throughout till, yeah. t- till now, basically? Till today, yeah. But, uh, did you ever feel that there is something in me that doesn't feel enough because because dad is not around. Not even because I don't know my dad. So to me, he's a stranger. Okay. Like, and I think my mom has done such a brilliant job at raising me that there's no 
void or anything of that sort. So I'm not those types of people that, you know, I'm like, oh my God, because I don't know my dad, something is missing or I need to go seek anything. Um, I'm just perfectly fine. Us in the black community, we see a lot of TV shows where mm-hmm. even even on YouTube, where people go around looking for their fathers, either mm-hmm. either because they want to do paternity tests or they want to find who they are. Why do you think you don't have that desire and you just see your dad as a stranger? You don't have that burning desire to say, I wish I knew my dad. I think it has to do with the fact that um, my mom's side of the family are coloreds. So within the colored culture, there isn't that longing or that... Um, in like okay i don't want to say importance but we don't kind of like put it out there that okay if you lack a father it means you lack something I get unlike you. the african community, um, community yeah. where there is so many ceremonies that must be performed sure. your surname is very important knowing where you come from is very important with me there isn't that thing you understand so my family does know my father's side of the family but for me there's nothing that that makes me be like, okay, let me just go look for them or like, me right. Yeah, yeah. I'm okay. Yeah, yeah. You lived between the Northwest and Kimberley up until yeah. how old? So I came to Johannesburg when I was eight, if I'm not mistaken. So my primary, I did it in the Northwest. Okay, so crash and then grade one, two, three in the Northwest. And then 2006, I came to Johannesburg. Would you say Johannesburg is the place where you started discovering your sexual identity? I would say that because, like, I was very... My family knew. They always knew. Ah, they always knew. <laughs> you know, like, my family will always make um, examples. They'll be like, hey, man, you know, Mang Mang is not gay. They were not born gay. They chose to be gay. Sure. This one was born gay. Okay. You okay, understand? Okay. So they knew. And, you know, and funny enough, I'm from a family where my uncle is a pastor. So it's very Christian. But they just let me express myself. And then they just waited and just to see, you know, um, how I turn out. And I guess I didn't disappoint when I brought a dude home. So in your teenage years, you were actively dating guys. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, no, the family knew and they knew about they it. Knew. Yeah. They knew. It's, it's quite interesting that you had that level of, of, of liberation. Yeah. Um, you turn 18, mm-hmm. uh, you're already in Joburg. Yeah. Uh, what's next? Because we're all in matric, grade 12, for mm-hmm. those who don't use the word matric. And then we all have these desires of what do we want to do. What's going on in your head in those matric final exams where you're like, I need to think of the future? What's going on in your head? Um, you know, the thing about me, right? Growing up, I always knew two things. Deep down, I was going to be famous and I was going to be rich, you know. And throughout um, high school, you know, I did presenting. I did all of that. So I always thought that I will go into the entertainment industry. But also at the same time, there was just this thing within the health industry that I just liked. But I think that was just more of a plan B type of thing, you know. Um, it wasn't really passionate, passionate, passionate. But yeah, so when I finished my A-level... I then pursued that, you know, at first I did um, psychology, I dropped out of that, and then I Where did you do psychology? So psychology, I did it at UJ, and then after a year, I was like, nah, this ain't for me. Okay. And then I left, and then I did my, I went to med school, then I studied, and then, yeah. Where where did you go to med school? So I went to Wits. You went to Wits? Mm Mm-hmm. Um, and completed med school at Wits? No. So due to the fact that, you know, um, in my final year, no, 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 my fifth year, I'm sorry. On my fifth year, my mom lost her job. Okay. And my mom was a domestic worker, so the employers were the one that were paying for my studies. And so their relationship didn't didn't end that well. It broke down. Yeah, it, it broke down. Yeah. So that's what resulted me living with my ex and then things happened with my ex. So in terms of that, I didn't complete my studies. So fifth year, you dropped out of med school. Yes. And at the time, you were in a relationship. Yes. The relationship had been going on for how long? Uh, when I moved in, two years. When you moved, two years? Yeah. So... When you moved in with him, you had been in a relationship for two years. Yes. Um, for, for, for completeness of the story, 
when does the relationship start? Because all of us seek companionship. Mm -hmm. And for it to get to two years before you move in together, it means there were many healthy components. I don't think it's fair that we, just because things end badly, we demonize mm. a person in their entirety. Mm -hmm. So give me the good parts of the relationship when it started. I mean, there were happy <laughs> moments, I'm sure. 100%. Um, I was staying with my mom. She was staying on his own. So we would get to see each other like... Um, he literally worked down the road. So we would get to see each other every, you know, time he knocks off. The relationship was a very caring relationship. It was, I think it was just two people very busy. But then we would go out. It shame. The person is a very caring person. Mm -hmm. Like, no shade, no nothing. Even when this whole thing, the drama happened, he was the first person to literally come to the rescue for yeah, me. Yeah, so, yeah. like, shame. In as much as, yes, he did what he did, but, like, he's the best. Whew. It's interesting that you guys have reconciled at <laughs> yeah. that level, considering um, 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 what he did. Mm -hmm. When did it go wrong with him? So, you know, like, when you move in with a person and you are with a person 24-7, and, you know, for me, when my mom was financially stable, I was very independent. Okay. So for me, I never asked money from him. When he did things, I would always be like, let's go 50-50, that type of thing. So when my mom then lost her job, then the option was I stay in Joburg or I go back to the Northwest. But in staying in Joburg was going to be tricky because of accommodation. So okay. he's like, no, come stay with me. So because he was already successful and was, I think, six, yeah, he's six, seven years older than me. Mm -hmm. So he had his life sorted. Mm -hmm. And he kind of like now became the person that was now taking care of me financially, everything. And became a father more than a lover. Uh, yeah, without you that. realizing. Exactly. It. Yeah. And then, you know, that narcissistic tendency kind of like you know, came full force. You know, yes, when we were not staying together, I was like, mm, this one is a narcissist, but, you know, I'm not surrounded by that 24-7. But when you are in that relationship, it just kind of like, you know, becomes bigger and bigger and bigger. And, you know, I'm also one person that... I'm not a submissive person. I'm not going to humble myself. And I think people on social media have seen that. Sure. So for me, if you do something... I will confront you and I will make noise. And that escalated things, I would say. Do you believe you were abused? 100%. I mean, there was, you know, it started with emotional abuse and then became physical, you know. So even when he cheated, um, he would tell me that, you know, I have no authority to say anything because, like, I depend on him. Huh. So the power dynamic kind of like changed. So for him, because I'm the provider, I can do whatever I want to do, you understand? So that was, and then it also became battle of the egos with me, you know? Because for me, I'm like, like, I'm not that type of person that just because you do one, two, three, doesn't mean I'm going to humble myself. I'm not going to eat humble pie. Do you remember how many times he cheated? Yo, <laughs> yo, you cheated a lot. What is a lot, Matthew? I would say cheated more than 20, I mean, 10 times. And it got to a point where it was now proving a point, huh. you know. So it wasn't that thing of cheating because from his side, there was something lacking in the relationship or, you know, whatever reason that we cheat. For him, it also just became that thing of, um, in his words, he cheated to, got to a point where he cheated to drive me away so I could leave, leave him. Exactly. And I didn't. How long did you stay throughout the, the period where it was abusive? Three years. So five years in total. <laughs> yeah. We've been together for five years. What was the final straw? You know, people would think that the final straw would... Is a moment, but it's yeah, continuous, exactly. right? And yeah. I think people would think when I found out about my HIV status and when he confessed that he deliberately infected me, huh. you know, people would think that would be my straw. And it wasn't. Like, there was that part of me that's like, okay, you know, it happened. Um, we will work through it, that type of thing. You know, for me, I always say never force a abuse victim to leave. 
you mustn't tell them to leave. Let it get to a point for them where they have seen that, you know what, I've tried it all and nothing is happening, nothing is working, and now I'm done. So there isn't that event that happened. It just got to a point where I'm like, I've tried it. I've tried counseling. I have tried speaking to the family, bringing my family. I've, I've tried it all, but this person is not interested. So let me just move on. And I think also becoming independent when I started my business and I started making money. And funny thing was that we didn't speak for, cause he also then started like was working between two provinces. Um, and also that drift and that thing of us not spending a lot of time and just me focusing on my business, building my business. It just made sense. Like, why are you still here? You know, you can afford what you want. Just go. And I did. And then I moved on to a new relationship and never looked back. Between him infecting you, you discovering your HIV status, him confessing it, and you leaving the relationship, what was the time period? Uh, so I got infected in November um, of 2019. And then I left, if my memory serves me correct, 2021. A year and a bit later. Yeah. I <laughs> like I think it. So even when I moved out, we were still like I was still trying to make it work, but then eventually it was yeah. like nah. Yeah. And I think after I left the relationship, the anger kind of like came because now I was going through depression. Okay. Um, and now that you know, when that honeymoon phase, and you know, like when you are somebody infects you and the person is there, there's that comfort to say okay at least the person is around you understand so i think for me i was in that phase so when he left or when i left and he was no longer there then the reality hit that oh you hiv positive hmm. you understand and then i remember me you know texting him and i'm like am i the first person that you infected that you know of like what about your previous um, relationships because you got infected um, in 2014. So you have dated other people before me. And he's like, no, those people knew I told them. So for me, there was that anger. Like, So this wasn't a thing that you felt uncomfortable talking about. But why me? Why am I the victim? Mm -hmm. You mm -hmm. understand? Mm -hmm. And I think I also then look at, looked at it from that lens of you know, you abused me, you beat me, then you infect me and you didn't intentionally and you had the gall to tell others, but not me. And yeah, that's when then I took the legal route. You know, I went to the police station to try and open a case of attempted murder. And unfortunately, contrary to popular belief, there is no law in South Africa that stipulates infecting somebody with HIV. It's attempted murder. You understand. So I now had to go through um, private prosecution, you know, where you get your um, private attorney and you pursue it through that way. So during that um, private prosecution, we also then did a civil um, um, case and we won the civil case. We got 800,000 and how much? 800,000. OK, <laughs> yes. Yeah. So 800,000, we got it. And yeah, and then I decided to no longer pursue the criminal matter because like, and plus my mom is a sweetheart and my mom loves him to bed. So my mom was like, you know what? Okay, yes, he did it. But then like, just let him be. Did he pay the 800000 No, he did, shame. He did. Pella, that person was moneyed. Yeah. Yo. Paid it in full. <laughs> Paid it in full Where, plus legal cost. Why in Zan? What did you do with eight hundred thousand? So with the eight hundred thousand, sir, and this is what today I'm like. You should have gone back to school and gotten that degree, mm -hmm. but I blew it. <laughs> like, I chopped that money, guys. Chopped, I chopped how? It. You went so, to Durban. <laughs> that 
not even. <laughs> so, <laughs> I mean, like the first trip outside of Joburg was to Cape Town. So I went with my um, Oh, you went straight to Europe? I went straight to Europe. Okay. You know, I went to go see, you know, the ocean, yeah. you know, um, gave some to my family, built my mom's house. And yeah, man, throughout the years, it just depleted, you know, there wasn't that, you know, entrepreneurial thinking mindset, mindset yeah, you yeah. know, so yeah. Crazy. It is. Uh, you, you repeatedly saying you, you feel like you should have finished your degree. Yeah. On record. You did not finish your degree. I didn't. Hey family, thank you so much for being loyal to Engineering Your Life. I know that if you're watching this, you're probably here for the second time or the third time. And please, if you're here for the second, third time, please may you kindly subscribe. Because if you subscribe, it helps us to get better conversation, get better guests, and get access to creating the best content that we can for you. So please don't forget to subscribe and make sure you continue watching this episode. I didn't. When do you start the social media businesses and what were the businesses okay. that you were operating, the multiple businesses? Okay. So let me start with how I started social media. So in 2010, 2021, um, we started an NGO with a couple of my friends. They were in the HIV and AIDS space. They were working for other NGOs. So there were counselors and nurses and et cetera. So we then started Greater Than AIDS Africa. We registered it. And our first funding was a peer educator um, training course where we would train um, teenagers about HIV and AIDS prevention and treatment. So that then um, equipped them with the certificate to be lay HIV counselors, right? So I, because I'm now infected, and, you know, yes, I speak about HIV from my experience, but I also want to do the testings, you know, and I can't do it because in order just to prick somebody's finger, you need to have a certification for that. So I then decided, let me actually be an HIV and AIDS counselor. So I did the training. After I did the training, I just felt like it was very restrictive because there were certain things that I couldn't do. And then I decided to do um, professional development, right? So with professional development, it's um, various training courses accredited by different institutions, HPCSA, the South African Medical Association, VETS. I think I have maybe about like 10 certificates, if I'm not mistaken. So that then allowed me to now become an advanced HIV and AIDS clinician. Now I'm able to not only do the HIV and AIDS testing, pre-counseling and post-counseling, but now I am able to draw blood. I am able to read a patient's lab reports. I'm able to translate it to the patient. Um, yeah, I'm able to speak about um, opportunistic infections, and I'm also able to assess if a patient might have opportunistic infections. So that is then how it started. But because, you know, in South Africa, the education in terms of HIV and AIDS, is where we're lacking. Mm -hmm. We then decided, you know what, let's actually start a social media. Here's TikTok, let's do it. And we then were like, okay, we need to come up with different characters. That is where Dr. Matthew was birthed, guys. Characters. Characters. Okay. So we trademark Dr. Matthew. So Dr. Matthew is a trademark intellectual property of Greater Than AIDS Africa. I hear you. So we have Dr. Matthew. We have Zingela and we have Doreen. Okay. Those are characters. And in our trademark, we are registered under education, right? So there's pamphlets, there's leaflets, there's booklets, and there is Dr. Matthew in a, in a cartoon form. I hear you. You understand? So my social media, the Dr. Matthew social media, was an extension of that. The cartoon. The yeah, character. the whole entire thing, the educational, mm -hmm. you know, and Dr. Matthew was that vehicle okay. to dispense, like to humanize, you know, the education and to simplify it. And to also have this young person that is infected, that's breaking stigma from the from his personal experience, but also from the medical knowledge and the facts and busting the myths and the misinformation. The medical knowledge that you had gotten from the certifications that you've done. Yes. Um, but these certifications 
are they equivalent to a medical doctor? Are they equivalent to a nurse, perhaps? No. So, for example, they. So, when you do professional development, you will choose what you actually wanna um, develop your skills in. So I chose HIV and AIDS. So they are not equivalent to a doctor, no equivalent to a nurse. That is why I would work under a nurse. I would work under a doctor. You understand? So it would, so, you know, like within our NGO, the nurse would be the one like to dispense the medication, to do the blood rolls. I can do the blood rolls. I can do the dispensing of the medication. You understand? Based on the fact that we have done your HIV testing, you have tested positive, and yeah. You open the TikTok. Then I opened TikTok. We yes. opened TikTok. Yes. Yeah. We, okay, yes. <laughs> the organization The opens. organization. And you. then, yeah, it just became Dr. Matthew's TikTok, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, then I just started talking about HIV. What was the year, by the way, when you opened the TikTok? 2021. And is 2021 the same year that it blew up? I would say it it maybe blew up 2022, yeah. you know. So you spent a year just tricking. Yeah, because I'm not a social media person. I'm not. I only had, um, what's this thing, TikTok as a social media thing. I didn't know nothing about this editing, nothing. So it just grew. I just went live on TikTok, answered questions, and it grew and grew and grew. And I just became the... First, I was called the HIV um, doctor, and then, you know, Dr. Matthew started. And, yeah, I became, I don't know if I should say a household name, but Mm -hmm. I became that. Absolutely. And I became trusted in everything that I said. And also, it wasn't just um, talking about HIV, but from the five years that I did my... um, medical school i you know you pick up things you know i mean five years almost you're almost done you know so there would be certain things i would see on tiktok where these content creators would plug people to use hydrocortisone on their skin to remove dark spots and i'd be like "Uh uh-uh no 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 so i then certain videos will then be videos calling out i hear you those types of uh, um contents to be like you know as content creators you know, we are chasing the likes, the comments, the, you know, shares, but we are harming people. And, you know, it cannot be that you're going to say pe- a person must use steroid on their face and yet you're using a filter. And I, I know it's a filter because I am a content creator as well. Mm-hmm. So for me, that is where I would say I got a lot of enemies in terms of these content creators. So, yeah. When do you start saying, actually, Dr. Matthew is no longer a character, he's no longer a cartoon, but it's becoming my reality on TikTok especially. Um, Do you think you remember that moment when that happened? Because now you started wearing a stethoscope in Mm -hmm. all your videos. Yes. So, you know, the thing with the stethoscope, um, the stethoscope has always been there. From day one. Okay. The scrubs has always been there from day one. You know, even when you uh, um, go into our NGO, there's stethoscopes always around. And so with the stethoscopes in the videos, it was also the aesthetics of it, you know, um, because it's a medical, talking about health stuff, we're talking about HIV. And also because people will be like, but then you are also in the hospitals. And even in those videos, right, because I think people think that I was there to masquerade as a doctor, but in those um, videos, like, as the years progressed, we got more funding. Now we got USAID funding, et cetera, to do different programs. And one of the programs was patient tracing, and in our defaulters program. Mm -hmm. So we would trace a patient. Um, who have defaulted on their ARV or TB treatment. Some of them, we just find that they went to another facility without getting a referral letter. Mm -hmm. Others, they've completely stopped their ARV treatment and they are sick. And we would then take them to their nearest facility. And when we drop you off at that facility, I would take a video and I would be like, okay, guys, this is what we have today. We have a gentleman stopped their ARV treatment two years ago. They are reasoning for stopping their ARV treatment. They would, for example, say that, no, my friend took me to their church. The pastor prayed for me. And then the pastor said, I must go, you know, test. 
elsewhere, not at the clinic that I went to test at the first time where I get my treatment, but a different one. Don't tell them that you were positive. And then they would go and test and then the test will come back as negative. And they would take that as, oh, I'm cured. But then when we look at their file, their viral, lo- their viral load is below 50. You are undetectable. So, of course, with the fifth generation test kit, it will show a false negative. But that doesn't mean you are cured. So, those would then be the reason behind taking videos in the hospital, you know. And we will take it as we are leaving the facility. 2022, around December, beginning of 2023, now you're getting campaigns. Yeah. Brand partnerships, <laughs> interviews on radio stations, uh, even the Department of Health is partnering with you to, 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 to drive campaigns. Mm-hmm. Would you honestly say to me when people called you Dr. Matthew, you did not feel like a medical doctor? So you see with those ones, right? Um, on my... On my TikTok, the one that got deleted, there was a disclaimer there. So when these brands approach, we would always give them a contract. Not a contract, but a disclaimer for them to sign and for them to acknowledge that if you are bringing me onto this campaign on the belief or on the basis that I'm a medical doctor, then you must know that I'm not going to accept it. You understand? So every single campaign signed it and we kept it. You understand? So with the Department of Health, with their June 16 um, campaign, they approached me based on the fact that I have a huge following. Mm -hmm. You understand? And they wanted to, their target audience was young people and to show them the different um, opportunities within the health sector. And we did it. And I remember that was my very, very first paid campaign. Send me a script, read it, and sent the video. It was uploaded. It was up until a follower of mine was like, Matthew, when we listen to this video, it implies you're a real doctor. Even how it was, the thing it was written on Twitter, it implies you're a real doctor. And I went back, because I'm not on Twitter, I looked at it, and I had to look at it from that lens. And I communicated with the department, and I still have those communication, and told them that, guys, how this thing come, is coming across, is coming across as if I am a doctor. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You understand? Can we please fix this? So I was then informed that I was the only non-medical person in that whole campaign. Everyone else was doctors, nurses, everything. Sure. So they had a template that was created. And it was for given those to people. everyone. And it was given to everyone. So when I read it, I wasn't reading it from that perspective. It was only when it was uploaded that I actually saw it from that perspective. For me, it was recorded. Saint, you are done. Continue with your life. What you're telling me now is that you had a huge following on mm-hmm. TikTok and the brand partnerships was from people understanding that you are influential to young people in medical uh, 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 issues, right? Yes. So you're a medical influencer. Yeah. I, yeah, you could say that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> My question still stands, though. Mm. did you in your mind at the time now start believing that I am a medical doctor? No. Then why, Matthew, did we go through weeks on end (laughs) of you absolutely standing your ground that you're a qualified medical doctor? You know, I think with that one, um, and when I look at it now, I'm like, "Mm, Matthew, you understand, you know, it, it, it comes down to, you know, like that, 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 you know, addiction that comes with all of a sudden you just have this whoosh attention. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. When it dropped, I don't want to lie. I laughed. When the first statement came on the 9th of October from the Department of Health, I laughed at it. I took it as a joke because I'm like, these people, like, really? Mm-hmm. Like, is it that going- deep? Like, is that what you thought? Not, it's it's a thing of 
But then we did the campaign. I sent you guys this uh, um, disclaimer. I even called you guys out that you must remove this video. I brought it to your attention. You ignored me. Then today, you, because social media is making noise, you're not going to come and be like, oh, no, guys, this is actually, as the department, this is what we know. Instead, you take it another route. So I've just found it absolutely ridiculous. You understand? And because I knew behind the scene, I'm protected. I have everything that I need to prove to this department that what did I do wrong? So in terms of social media, I, shame, I just took it as a, as a joke, like, you know, one minute I'll be like, no, I'm not a doctor. And people will be like, oh, okay, now you're good. Then when I saw it, mm -mm, man, why is like the noise is going down? Then I come back mm -hmm. and I'm like, yes, guys, I'm a doctor. And then vujugu again. So it was just that. Okay. <laughs> so, so you're saying you have disclaimers and evidence that yeah. you're, and you knew you're not a doctor and you're a medical influencer. Mm. But whenever the attention would shift away from you, because fame clouts is a drug. Yes. You would come back and say, I'm a doctor, guys, because yeah. you knew how much it brought <laughs> attention. Exactly, because again, like, in as much as I would say that, people would be like, okay, receipts. And then I don't prove. Mm, mm, Give mm, the receipts. Mm. You understand? So it was just that thing. People are constantly, like, <sighs> provide us with something. Yeah, and yeah. I didn't. So it's like, you know, just baiting them bit by yeah it was it was that you know was that cloud to making you money matthew because a lot of people especially tiktok <laughs> tiktok south africa creators are not making money yeah for the lack of a better word many of them are actually broke they are rich in followers zero in the bank account yeah right um why are you hanging on to this fame if it's actually causing you drama to that level of drama where it was now being legal drama Mm. So, you know what I did? So, TikTok, guys, TikTok doesn't pay. You know, you get paid by brands. But you need to be smart when you go live on TikTok. Because when you go live on TikTok, um, at the time, TikTok had updated the app. And you were able to choose who can comment and who can engage with your live. And you could limit it to your subscribers. And you have to pay to be a subscriber. I get you. So, I was went. Not general. If you want to comment, if you want me to see your nasty comments, yeah. pay. Yeah, yeah. And that's what happened. So on a live, I would have 22,000 people. Sure, sure. And of course, not 22,000 will comment, but at least you would have a good 15K, good 10K. Are you serious? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So yeah. each and every single one of them would pay a, a subscription. That's interesting because and be, sorry to say, yeah. and because Dr. Matthew is trademarked, the more you use my name, the more I make money. Interesting. Um, take me to the day of that 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 video that broke the internet, Which? where <laughs> I know there's millions of them, <laughs> but that particular yeah. one where you you. There's blood all over mm, you. My trauma. You're being beat down in what looks like yeah. a, an office in a hospital. Mm -hmm. uh, but you're going to correct all of that for us mm. and just take us step by step. Mm. Take me to that day. Mm. How did it start? Where were you going? Because so for us, it looks like this guy was going to act like a doctor once again <laughs> at a hospital. Yeah. What's the truth? So um, that was on the 29th of October on a Saturday, Sunday. Mm -hmm. It was on a Sunday. So, in our NGO, um, so as I said earlier on, we drop off patients, right? So, on the 27th of October, um, two days earlier, we were working in Region B where Helen Joseph is located. And we dropped off a patient there. And when we drop off a patient, we have a drop-off form that we keep a copy. The facility has a copy. The facility stamps our copy. My information is there. So that's what we did. For me, although the drama was happening, for me, it had to be business as usual. You understand? So we dropped off a patient. Our contact information is there. My name is there. I left. Right? Again, I did a video. Like I always do when I'm at a facility and I left. 
So because they could see Hore at the back, if you know a hospital, man, you know this this hospital, and I must get Helen Joseph. Then on that Sunday, it was around 3 p.m. Um, we get a, a, a WhatsApp. And it's a WhatsApp from a staff member at Helen Joseph saying that, listen, um, we need you guys to come and do a statement for the patient that you dropped off because mm-hmm. the patient is an unknown patient. Mm-hmm. That is normal for you to do, especially if we don't have next of kin, anything, and the patient might be on their dying bed. You know, the facility needs to try, involve social development, try to locate the family. Sure. So for us, it was nothing out of the ordinary, mm-hmm. you understand? So, okay, we told them that, listen, we are working in Kahuso. Once we're done, because we are in Malville, Malville is five minutes from Helen Joseph, sure. we will come by write it, leave. I should have listened to my friend slash is like, Mm-mm. something is fishy. La. And I'm like, ah, man, doesn't matter. And why uh, um, she said that it was because it was Sunday. We had said, no, we'll come on Monday. And, but, and then they were like, okay, please come. The people that dropped him must come. And on that Monday, I was going on my leave because of this whole drama. And they insisted, but like, no, we need all the people that were, that dropped off this patient. We need them, need them. And that's when my friend was like, and I guess set up. And for me, I was like, ah, let's go. Okay. We went, it was, we went to the office, dropped off what we needed to drop off. Our, our way back, we passed by Helen Joseph. It was around 7 PM. We entered through the casualty of Helen Joseph, um, and at that time, the emergency ward was not, they were renovating it. So it was the one upstairs. So we went there. I'm like, hi, this is who I am. We got this. So yeah, the nurse is like, no, sit down. Okay, no problem. We sit. And then I'm like, okay, I want to go to the bathroom. I stand up. I go to the bathroom. As I'm like, literally in front of the bathroom door, three security guards they stop me. Yay, yeah, 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 wait, 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 wait. Okay. Yeah. Come with us. Come with us. Okay. The Dr. Matthew thing is not in my mind. You understand? I'm like, how? What did I do now? You understand? Hey, okay, we go to the, um, to the, what is this thing called? To the um, security room. Mm-hmm. They were like, sit down. Somebody's going to come and talk to you. I'm like, okay, regarding what? Now, I thought that, okay, maybe we did something in the parking lot because this room has, you know, monitors, CCTV monitors. I'm like, Ivo, what did we do? They're like, no, don't worry, sit here. I am sitting. I think I probably sat for about 15 minutes without this person not coming. Again, I'm like, what am I waiting for? Who am I waiting for? Who am I waiting for? Yeah. No, you will find out. I'm like, the fact that you stopped me and you bring, you brought me here, clearly you have an idea. Mm -hmm. You might not have the whole story. Sure. But but you know something. You know something. Sure. Give me that. You understand? They didn't want. You understand? I'm like, okay, I'm leaving. They're like, no, 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 no. Sit down. I'm like, what is it about? Then they were like, no, we want to ask, are you Dr. Matthew? I'm like, ah. I'm like, so, and then (laughs) they were like, no, we want to ask you a couple of questions. I'm like, about what? No, you know, the department has opened a case. So we want to ask you questions. I'm like, no. Who is asking this? Who's saying all of this? So the security. Oh, now it's the the security. still. So Andre, I am insisting on on being told, being told, give me that person can come, but at least let me sit here knowing what am I waiting for? Mm -hmm. You Mm -hmm. understand? Mm -hmm. She's like, no, we just want to ask you a question. And I, I'm like, no. I'm like, it's very, and I said it, it is inappropriate for you guys to ask me a question. And yet the police have not taken my statement. Remember they opened the case on the 9th of December, of October. This was on the 29th. So all those weeks passed. In fact, when we found out that the case was opened again through the media. Myself and my attorney went to Brixton, presented myself at Brixton, and the investigating officer said, okay, 
there's not really much in the docket for us to arrest you. Give us your information. I gave my address. I gave my number. I gave a copy of my ID, my attorney's information, everything. They're like, when we need you, we will contact you. Okay. Two days later, the police came to my apartment. They confirmed that I stayed there. They found me, asked neighbors, no problem. So I'm now waiting for the investigation to continue and for me to be brought in for questioning. So I say to them, I've not been questioned by the police. Why would I give you guys a statement or answer something that is going through a police investigation? And you are working for the department. The department is the one accusing me. So I'm not entertaining it. If you want questions, I can provide you the contact details of my attorney. At this point, I'm mad. I'm irritated. You understand? Again, in my head, I'm thinking, Vele, Vele, we are still here to sign that statement of the unknown patient. So I'm like, you know what? I'm going. They're like, no. I'm like, am I under arrest? They were like, no. I'm like, okay, I'm going. Yeah, yeah. So I fought to leave that room. You understand? And because for them, their communication with this um, person is delayed somewhat. I then went, proceeded to go to the bathroom again. I am just like, you know, I'm just trying to go back to casualty so I can literally tell the person I came with what just happened. Okay. You understand? Okay, I'm in the bathroom. I finish. I leave. So as I leave, they are following me. They are, they are talking on their walkie-talkie. I'm just going out, right? And when you go out, because of that emergency room is closed, you have to basically like go outside and then climb that hill nyana to go to the casualty. How all of a sudden, commotion. Vimba, vimba, yebat. What are we vimbering now? So I look back, it's torches, walkie-talkies are making noise. And I'm like standing there and they're pointing at me. And I'm like, what? Yo. They just grab. Boom! On the floor. So I'm basically like being, not chusk, it's not choke slam when they hold your throat. Mm, but I'm mm, literally mm, mm. thrown on the ground. And I just feel this piercing pain going from my hip mm. down to my leg. Mm. And I'm screaming. I'm like, get the F off me. Get off me. You now have more than 10 people busying, um, making noise. Others are coming. Backup is being called. Mm. Hey, it's a commotion outside. I'm being picked up. I'm being punched. I'm being kicked. The mo- I'm being dragged back to where I'm from. That room. Back to that room. Yeah. I am now, at this point, the whole entire hospital is hearing the commotion. So when I'm being dragged back, it's like, you know, a corridor of shame. People, but what was the patient there? But busy, finally, So I, I get dragged. I'm, I'm dragged to that room. I'm now fighting. That's the infamous video where I'm bleeding. Okay. And they are forcing my, forcing to handcuff me. This is after you've been kicked and thrown kicked, down. Kicked, thrown the most. Okay. Both my, my hands are handcuffed and my legs are handcuffed. Legs even. Yeah. Huh. And then the room is full of every boat. Phone on my face, in my face. Paparazzi. Paparazzi. Hence that sound um, where I'm like, everybody get out. Yeah, get yeah, out the room. Yeah, you understand? Yeah. Because now I'm just traumatized. <sighs> you understand? Okay. Here comes this important person we were waiting for, which is the matron. Okay. At the time, she's the most senior. Nursing manager. Yeah. 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 So because it's night. See all but who they are, are gone. not there. So yeah. she's and the, it's weekend. It's weekend, so yeah. she's the the one. Okay. She sits on the other side of the table. Yeah. It's only the security guards. And then she tells me, she's like, Are you Dr. Matthew? I'm like, Yeah, Muzlizala the videos that's a TikTok. You can see Hore, I'm Dr. Matthew. You understand? <laughs> yeah. So okay, then they were like, Nope. So they start interrogating me, mm. and they want this statement. 
And then they were like, yeah, you've brought the department into disrepute. You are bogus doctor, um, this and that and that. And we need, what are you doing here? So I'm telling them what I'm doing here. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I am here because we dropped off a patient on the 27th. And now we get Ask for a statement. A statement, which is not out of the ordinary. I am here for that. So what's happening? They were like, no, no, no. She presents me a affidavit, but the Department of Health template one. On the wall, there is a picture of me. A, basically a wanted man picture. With my picture, the Department of Health is saying... Mark Short. Mark Short. It's written, attention, members of the public and staff. This person is not a doctor. If you see this person on our premises... Please report it or Please something. report it, call security, everything. I'm looking at this, I'm like, how? What in the defamation of character is this? You understand? So now they are telling me that they've been on the lookout for me. The securities are laughing and saying, hey, this thing operation was successful. <laughs> what thing operation are we doing as security guards to only find out that them sending that communication was a way of lowering me there. Okay. And because, yes, I'm wearing scrubs. The scrubs is the NGO scrubs because it has the name, the emblem of the NGO, everything. I'm now told that I'm assigned a statement. And the confession statement had to go something like, you know, I came to the facility that day to pretend to be a doctor and that because they found my ARV treatment in my pocket because I was wearing a big jacket and they searched and that there was ARVs there that I was, my intention was to provide patients with ARVs. Basically, hey, you know, examining patients, slaughtering patients with medication, everything. And then I'm like, no, I'm not going to do it. And in the same time, I'm bleeding from my mouth. My wrist, this one, you can even see this scar. Mm-hmm. It's swelling around the cuffs. And I'm in excruciating pain. And for me, I'm like, can I see a doctor? A matron said to me, no, you will only see a doctor if you send the confession. And I refused. And I was handcuffed for three hours. Hmm. I was handcuffed for three hours. It got so bad. The pain just became so excruciating that I just had to come up with something. In my mind, I'm like, Matthew, tell them what you, they want to hear. And you're going to sign this affidavit. Don't use your real name. Don't use your real ID number. Don't use your real signature. You will with Ibona afterwards. And I did. I wrote a fake name, fake surname, some random ID you? number. I was my cousin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I was my cousin. Yeah. So I gave my cousin's name, um, Mposwart, you yes. know. I gave that. I don't yeah, I just made up an ID number. Sure. Made up a signature and The matron is coaching me on what to write Mm. and I'm writing it. And now she's like, now it's a proper interrogation. Now I'm supposed to write. So they unhandcuff me. Okay. She's asking me questions. I'm now apologizing. I'm sorry. I didn't mean any harm, you know, this and that and that and that. I'm unaware I'm being recorded. I'm just saying what I'm focusing on this individual because I just need to see a doctor. It was only at the end that when I turned my head, their head of security is secretly recording me. And I'm telling him, I didn't give you permission to record me. And yeah, when are you not going to tell us anything? When are you going to jail? I'm like, whatever. I'm still standing my ground. I did nothing wrong. So now I'm supposed to see a doctor. I don't get to see a doctor. I'm handcuffed again. Now they call the police. Three hours after I was assaulted and kept there, only now the police are brought in. Mm -hmm. Brixton is literally two streets away. 
The police come. They don't ask me nothing. They don't ask me any questions. They are handed the confession. The police then say that this person is injured. How did this person get injured? That is where, no, sorry. Before that, the security guards were also asked to write statements to give to the police to talk about how I, how I was arrested. So they are there get, at their little corner, you know, cooking up a story. And then one of them is like, this person is going to go to court and is going to be injured. Bazoti sim shai. Zizoti hai. He tried to escape. Okay, cool. The, the, the police, they were like, no, this person must see a doctor. Okay. Again, I'm, I can't walk. I can't walk, right? They're forcing me to walk. I can't walk. I'm just collapsing. You understand? Because my feet can't hold my body. I am handcuffed back to casualty. I get there. The matron has already told the doctors what happened. The doctor's like, how? Apparently, you jumped out the fourth floor window. I'm like, four. Four. I zoop, Spider-Man. I'm like, me? I'm like, no, I didn't. They call the orthopedic surgeon. They call all these doctors. I have a team of doctors trying to now assess these injuries. The doctors, they were like, what happened? I'm like, I was beaten. I didn't jump out a window. I was beaten. The doctors are writing. They are writing. They are writing. Okay. I was kept there for three, for two hours. And then they said, you have two options. So they said to me, your injuries are that you have a, a fractured wrist, a fractured hip, a, tip to, a chip tooth. Um, and yeah, my ribs were just bruised in J. But those are your injuries. So you can stay here in the hospital until you get well or we discharge you. In my head, I'm like, I want to be discharged. I don't want to be in this hellhole. You understand? Because what's the point? I'm going to be in this hospital bed with handcuffs, police monitoring me the whole entire time. I will be made a mockery of by these nurses. I might as well just go. In my head, I'm going home. And I'm like to the, to the doctor, am I going home? She's like, no, you're going to jail. <laughs> I'm like, okay. The police come. Shem, I don't want to lie. The arresting officers, they were nice. Before that, I'm handcuffed on the hospital bed. Mm -hmm. At some point, I'm half naked from there. The security is taking pictures, taking videos. Because the MEC of health wants them. Because by before midnight, they need to release a statement. So I must now, the medical treatment has to be stopped. I must stand up. I must be handcuffed so that we can take pictures for the MEC. Okay, we did it. I got discharged and then I was transported to Brixton. Get to Brixton, the police is like, this ID number is, does not exist. I'm like, but then why are you taking information from a statement that you as the police didn't take? Because how this statement was obtained was obtained under condition that was torturous. You understand? Hi, okay. I then, I was given medication, painkillers, everything. Um, I was given a private cell um, because apparently I'm a high priority suspect. So I was given uh, my own cell where I was by myself. And then I'm like, okay, can I please have my ARV medication? They were like, no. Can I have painkillers? No. So I spent three days at Brixton Police Station without access to my ARV medication, without painkillers, without any form of medication. Even food for two days, I wasn't given food for two days. My attorney came on the third day that I was going to court with McDonald. During that time, I, I did not eat. I did not get access to my medication, nothing. Were you released on bail? No. So how do you so, go home? Okay, so... On the 31st of October, I come. I found out that is the hoax that is investigating my case. So the hoax were given the case on the day I got arrested, on the 29th. It was no longer being investigated by Brixton police. It wasn't at the station level. Now it was the hoax. So, okay, 
Um, the hawks comes, picks me up in their vehicle. I'm taken to the hawks' offices to do fingerprints. Um, during that time, my attorney, Mabunda, is communicating. We get to Johannesburg Magistrates Court. I'm at the assault. The My lawyer comes like, we are speaking to the NPA, but this is what you must expect. If we if they put the matter on the roll, you're going to go. There is media outside, so just prepare yourself. We are also organizing that when you get to um, Sun City, at least you are isolated. I was like, okay, no problem. 30 minutes later, he comes and is like, your matter has been withdrawn. You're going home. Okay, I go home. And then he explains to me that when the NPA looked at the docket and the evidence that was provided in the docket, there was no evidence to support any of the allegations that I was arrested of, including the statement that the Department of Health released to, 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 to basically telling the nation how I got arrested, that I was there to impersonate, that I was wearing a... Because remember that they said I was wearing a, um, a hoodie with a stethoscope around my neck, everything. Kante Lindman stethoscopes, they engrave your name at the back of it. And that stethoscope did not belong to me, but belonged to a, a doctor at that hospital. So we found out that the doctor misplaced it. Then whoever found it took it to the security room. They are lost and found box. Kandit was taken out and they claimed that it was mine. So the Department of Health, they opened the case but provided zero evidence to prove that I impersonated a doctor. And that was then, the matter was then not put on the roll. But because this is apparently Dr. Zingelwa opened a case of me for identity theft, the, the NPA instructed that, okay, you're going to search his phone to see if maybe you can't find any evidence. And you're also going to go to Tembisa. You're going to take that docket and the hoax, you're going to make it one docket and investigate those allegations. They did that four months ago. The Hawks concluded its further investigation. Now we don't know where the docket is. The docket is now missing. Did you lose everything? Their, vi lost... their videos going around ever since that last moment where you, you, you left from jail, you, you almost disappeared from the world. Mm. Now their videos going around where there's you where you're saying how much you've lost. Mm -hmm. um, did you lose everything? And whom do you attribute losing everything to? So I did lose um, everything. Um, you know, after I got arrested and my devices were taken, now I'm sitting without a phone, so no access to social media. So that adrenaline is gone. You understand? So now I get to see the damage. And my business is affected. My NGO, I'm now removed from the NGO. Um, everything is falling apart. And the anger comes in. And the anger from the Department of Health and this department is why you lied. You knew the truth and you decided to throw me under the bus. You, you, you create the statement to say that I was there to impersonate a doctor. I jumped out the third floor window, everything. But yet, even your own doctors say that my injuries are as a result of an assault. The description of what you said I wore on the day that I got arrested is from an old video that has absolute nothing to do with the day that I got arrested. That video that they are talking about, which, and I remember it is the video where I was talking um, about the locker. That was not taken at that facility, and it was also taken at a completely different day. But the department created the narrative that it was created on that day. And then your staff members take videos without my consent where I'm talking about my HIV status. They post it on the internet for clout, for excitement, for what? And then you have the audacity to deny me access to my ARV treatment when I went to your facilities after I get arrested. I'm denied that access. I take the matter with the Human Rights Commission. 
you come and you say you did some bogus investigation. In that investigation, you claim that I'm not a patient of that facility, of the local clinic, and that I'm not on the tier.net database, which is a database that every HIV positive person is on. You claim, you tell the country that. So you are now bringing my HIV status into question. And thank God, with the assistance of the city of Johannesburg's public information officer, we were able to subpoena my medical records from that facility. And we were able to get my patient summary from the tier.net database. The very same database you said I'm not on. Yet all of a sudden, it's showing that I've been on that database since 2019 when I got infected. And it, 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 it matches my clinic card. Why do I have a chronic clinic card if you say I'm not HIV positive? You understand? And then you also have this Department of Education releasing my educational background. <laughs> like... Ningena PU as the Department of Education, because this is a matter of the Department of Health and me and them. Do you understand? So now the anger came. And I wanted justice. So my business affected, my business partners, you know, ran away with the business money, everything. I have no cent to my name in my account. I have my car, I have my apartment. Eight hundred thousand gone. Ah, they dollar that one finished in jail. Yeah. By the time that this drama started, my business had brought in close to three million. Do you understand? That is gone. And we were about to launch a new product. And so imagine I'm sitting with stock, dololo customers. I hear you. You understand? Because your name is it's gone. Yeah. Like it's ruined. So now I have to sell my apartment. I now have to sell my car so that I can get attorneys to help me sue. The state. Is that where you are now? That's where I am. And with our documentary, we go, you're going to get to see that whole entire process. I hear you. You understand? So I moved in with my mom where she was working. Still as a, still as a domestic worker. Yes. She, so she basically had to now find a job because of this drama. You understand? So she came back to... Um, she was between Joburg, so she had to come back. When she was here, a friend found her a job, and it was a stay in, you know, domestic work. I stayed with her. That finished, and we were like, okay, now we're basically homeless. So I had to swallow my pride and be like, we have to go to a shelter. And that's where I've been. You know, you created a character, Dr. Matthew, mm -hmm. who was a cartoon character even initially. It became an online TikTok character. Mm -hmm. You then acknowledged that you're a medical influencer. Mm -hmm. You tried to inform all people you were partnering with that I'm a medical influencer. I'm mm -hmm. not a medical professional. Mm -hmm. There's a huge distinction and it must be maintained. Mm -hmm. You felt that people still rode on you being a doctor and it made you a lot of money. It got you a lot of attention. It made you start a business. It got you a lot of clout. Mm -hmm. You also ran with it. Mm -hmm. You also, because the fame was nice, <laughs> you also then came online and reaffirmed many times that, yes, guys, I'm a medical doctor. Mm -hmm. Yes, guys, I'm a medical doctor. Matthew, you're, right now you're in a shelter. Had you not chased the money and the fame, could, do you believe your story could have turned differently? Uh, I think so. I think it would have been more of the damage would have not been as much. You understand? Like, I think had that thing started and I squashed it right there and then, it would have not gotten to that level where I lost quite a lot. You understand? But also at the same time, in as much as I do also need to take accountability and responsibility for the role that I played in where I am right now, there are also certain people that also need to take that responsibility, which are the departments, you understand? Because they knew, but then they decided to see this as a PR opportunity, you understand? Because for me, I felt like, you know, it was here you have this 
influential person claiming to be a doctor. And here in Joburg, we have issues with big doctors. So we're going to use him as an example. But unfortunately, it didn't go as they planned. And that's where we have them. In South Africa, in Joburg, in the world, um, yeah. we have a culture, a celebrity culture that has infected or affected many people, especially people who are TikTok stars. Mm. It seems like you were no different, mm-hmm. where power and money took over what you thought was your character. 100%. Um, it made you make decisions that compromised you, your life a lot. Mm. And it took so much from you right now, you're having to start again from the beginning. Exactly. I hope yeah. you learn that mm. when you let power and money take over, these are the results. Mm. And I hope as you rebuild, because this is which directly means there is no bin to throw a person. Yeah. I really hope that as you rebuild, because you're an intelligent person, mm. if you were able to build businesses and be able to build everything that you build, um, you're going to build more and you're going to exceed more than, than you already had. I so that so. dream to still have a lot of money <laughs> and be famous, it's still fine. Yeah. But please approach fame and money. Um, with more intelligence, with morals and principles now, Exactly. Uh, and use it for the betterment of society. Yeah. When is the documentary coming out? So the documentary, we're going to drop it in February. We don't have an exact date yet, but it's going to be in Feb. And yeah, man, you get to see, you know, everything. You know, you get to hear from my mom, my friends, family, Experts, you get to see, once we find this police docket, because nobody knows where it is, um, you will get to see the content of the docket. So the things that were not made public, you get to truly, truly see it. And I think also this documentary is just kind of like, you know, me answering whatever questions people have and also it being me closing that chapter and opening a new one and rebuilding a new one. So I know a lot of people say I must come back on social media. Even me coming back on social media, it's going to be very different. You know, even the content that you guys are going to get to see, it's absolutely going to be different. Um, yeah, man, I think, you know, oh, Dr. I will still be Dr. Matthew, the name, because I feel like, you know, <laughs> it's just iconic. But the things that that Dr. Matthew was doing, that won't gone. be the same. No, it's not going to be the same. I hope you guys um, realized, myself, absolutely, I realized that um, we make mistakes, we make huge mistakes. Some of us luckily don't make those mistakes on camera. So we're able to rebuild ourselves quietly and restore our lives. Dr. Dr. Matthew just made the mistake of making those mistakes of cam- on camera and in the public eye. I hope you forgive him. Looks like he's forgiven himself. <laughs> uh, yeah. um, and he's rebuilding himself. Because remember, there is no bin to throw away a person because God restores. I'll see you guys on the next episode. Thank you, Matthew. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs> Introducing the epitome of luxury living. Galu Luxury Villas and Suites, your private sanctuary of opulence and elegance. Nestled amongst the lush, sun-kissed landscapes of Durban, KwaZulu-Natal, this Galu Luxury Villa is a paradise of tranquility, offering breathtaking panoramic views of the neighborhood. Step into a world of refined luxury where every detail has been meticulously crafted to create an atmosphere of sophistication and comfort. This villa is kept within a gated and secure property for your peace of mind. The Kalu Villa is available for both short-term and long-term stays, making it the ideal location for your next vacation or special event. This villa boasts spacious living areas and floor-to-ceiling windows that flood the interior with natural light, making you feel at one with the surrounding beauty paired with multiple terraces, an outdoor lounge and a dining area. Live the dream, make memories and indulge in the life you deserve. 
contact us today to book your stay or to learn more about this exquisite property. Your oasis of opulence awaits.